well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Michael Kester is the name of my co-host here, if you'd like to add him on Facebook. Thank you. This show is co-co-hosted by myself, Eric Ingram, which means you're listening to Double Feature. That is, in fact, the meaning, if the intro didn't give it away. And today on Double Feature, we have some uh, science commentary films. Uh, They're delivering commentaries in perhaps a way you might not suspect of them. Yeah. What are those two movies? We're doing Gattaca and Reanimator in that order, not the opposite order. So we're just going to talk about God's handiwork the whole time? Is that the idea (laughs) behind the show? I think we'll get to God's handiwork... uh... Pretty pretty soon here. But All right, first, well, we're going to spoil. Yeah, is that where you were? That's yeah, exactly you like where that, I was going. You? We're going to spoil the films. Uh, you've seen Gattaca. You saw it probably in 1997. I saw it. Yeah, in my biology class. And uh, oh yeah, <laughs> that's what I should have said. You saw Gattaca in your biology class. Yeah, that are on double feature ripoff. No wait, no, it was the other one. It was Film Shack, right? What? I think it was called Film Shack. It's that podcast we inspired that only did like oh, three yeah, episodes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, they did do Gattaca. Yeah, they did Gattaca a while ago. Double uh, Feature Ripoff is actually still running. Double Feature Ripoff is the show we're doing today, ripping off Film Shack. Yeah. You know what? Let's honorarily call today's episode Film Shack Ripoff. Sure. All right. So if you remember back to your high school, was it high school biology? Oh, yeah. You didn't go where, to college. Well, <laughs> where did you take biology other than high school? I don't know. Um, if you remember back to high school biology and Gattaca, if you don't, there's going to be some spoilers. Uh, we're also doing the film Reanimator. Reanimator is not going to have a lot of spoilers. No, it's Gattaca not. Will. Although we kind of, we, we artfully danced around Reanimator once already on the show and today we're going to split it wide the fuck open. Yeah. We, uh, talked about it during that music box episode mm-hmm. and I think strangely, this is, this is why I'm really starting to dig when we hit around year five, maybe we can just start recovering films. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think we're going to talk about anything we talked about last time. Great. Uh, we briefly mentioned Reanimator. If your device was uh, invented after uh, the year Gattaca came out, okay. then it probably has chapters. None of the technology in Gattaca can use chapters, but the, uh, the personal listening device that you're utilizing is better than any of the technology in the film Gattaca, and yeah. it has chapters more than likely. Yeah. Or a lyric section. So Zune, iPod, chapters, piss fax machine, no chapters. I don't think Zunes have chapters, um, or, nor do they exist anymore. But if you get on your Windows Phone 8, is that a thing that exists? I can't Windows Phone that. 7? Doesn't matter. Use the chapters to skip over the films you have not seen, or uh, just go on the website or look in the lyric section. It'll tell you the little time code. We've been talking way too long. Let's talk about Gattaca. I want to open with the quote that Gattaca opens with. There's, okay. there's dueling quotes, and we always just mock them and then start discussing <laughs> right. what you and I consider the film. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to do Gattaca credit, and I'm going to say that it actually believes the opening quotes are part of the film okay. rather than just the let's all go to the movies concession right. uh, sure. pre, pre-show. And by opening quotes, you're not talking about Ethan Hawke's voiceover. No, I'm not, but we will get to that. The first quotation that's shown, uh, almost as an, what is that, intertitle when it's in a silent film? Consider God's handiwork. Who can straighten what he hath made crooked? Now, (laughs) before I even get to the second (laughs) quote, this quote showed up on the screen. Yeah. And um, do you remember verbatim your brilliant reinterpretation of this Uh, quote? So just again, very briefly, consider God's handiwork. Who can straighten what he hath made crooked? I don't think I remember it verbatim, but I know that you wrote it down. I did write it down because it was amazing. Now, what this quote is probably supposed to say, and let me inform you before I deliver the great thing you said, God made a perfect creature, and who would ever attempt to rectify, you know, God's Uh brilliant image? But uh, the way you interpret it was, uh, and again, this is verbatim, (laughs) God fucked up. Uh, Who can fix that? (laughs) That was your interpretation of that quote atheist on the I'm show sorry yeah, that seemed like that. fucking <laughs> that heathen honestly seemed like that was what they were heathen. trying to say no that's not what they were going for and let me here's the the opposing side this film opens a debate immediately before it even really starts the opposing quote is uh, i not only think that we can tamper with mother nature i think mother nature wants us to that seems a little incestuous yeah by our buddy willard by the way yeah 
mother wants us to tamper. Not our buddy Andrew, who directed the film. Right. Who is uh, also did Lord of War, right? Lord we of talked War. About and then him. he did The Truman Show, which is a movie people like. And we Simone, haven't done that. Which is a the, movie people I don't, don't know, how know those, about. Yeah. Not sure how those didn't make their way into, you know, year one of our show. We had seen them. So you've uh, shown your hand pretty early yeah. <laughs> here. Um, these are supposed to be conflicting viewpoints. On the one hand... We have, uh, you know, God makes uh, perfect, beautiful images, blah, blah, blah. Dirk, dirk. And it's all, uh, you know, natural. And sure. on the other hand, we can use science to fuck with that. And isn't that cool? I think they're both. Uh, no, I'm not even going to pretend. They're not both equally represented in the movie. No, they're certainly not. So this gets into a conversation that I'm mostly I feel like we can gloss over. Yeah. Uh, but you want might want to dive into a little bit. I don't know. Um, when people talk about this movie. Mm -hmm. I think largely they talk about these two ideas. Which is Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman. Yeah, now I... No, it's not. I um, I kind of have a different takeaway from this movie, and okay. I'm curious to hear sort of, sort of what you think about it. Now, we get this big opening voiceover. Vincent's explaining his birth. And I just see that as a, a big explanation of an unnecessary problem. You know, we're talking about uh, this natural birth and... The doctor's going, well, we're going to make sure he doesn't have, you know, leukemia and all sure. that great stuff. And uh, his parents are thinking, well, you know, we want to we want to roll the dice a little bit. Let's, uh, you yeah. know, let's make this fun. Um, I don't know. It kind of reminds me. It's like the, the person who goes to the grocery store and they have to get fruits made without any pesticides. Right. And then they get their fucking fruit home and they complain that there's a bunch of bad spots and that it rots too fast. Right. You know what and I mean? And it doesn't taste that good. Right, but you don't want to get those evil pesticides. You don't want to get the best fuck fruit. Fuck it up here. Yeah. <laughs> Who would want the best fruit? I mean, come on, let's not be greedy here. Shop smart. Shop science smart. It's it's kind of like the film is almost saying something along the lines of, uh, people are imperfect, they should have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, right. That's, uh, that is, I mean, that's initially what the film kind of purports is, People, I mean, it basically, God fucked up, right? Yeah. God fucked up, <laughs> sure. but instead of who will fix it, which I thought it meant, it's God fucked up and we shouldn't try to fix it because God fucked up on purpose. Okay, and see, this is where it gets into uh, what I think my, my take on the film ultimately is, which is a, a little bit different than, especially in the beginning. In the beginning, I think the film is almost uh, trying to throw you a curveball. It's saying, oh, here's our protagonist. He's the natural one. We're going to be rooting for the genetically natural person in a society of Orwellian, you know, everybody. Yeah, it's equilibrium again. It is, right? yeah. Um, there's a, a lot of similarities between this and equilibrium, and uh, especially the just the feeling of mm -hmm. the film. Although equilibrium is set in the future, and this is set in 1946, apparently. <laughs> Fucking fax machines. You see how society values the genetically superior. Yeah. And I think this is more a commentary on that society than a big natural versus genetically altered. Yeah. It's, uh, it tries to tell you it's that competition. It shows you the competing brothers literally right. in a swim match. In a race. Uh, it's two brothers swimming for the human race is what happens. It's the human race in the ocean. But there's also a lot of uh, societal oppression, and that's what it moves into right after that, that opening uh, phase. It's class warfare, though. It's the same as it ever was. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately where I stand. I mean, I'm a libertarian. Guess how I feel about class right. warfare, right? Like, <laughs> I don't need to even come on here and talk about class warfare. We've, uh, we've pointed that out in, in films prior to this, too. But a lot of people question this, this new problem, genetic manipulation. This sure. is probably why they show it in yeah. biology class. In learning about the human genome, you kind of inherently get this picture of, okay, if these are the building blocks, mm -hmm. why don't we build Better the best blocks. ones, right? <laughs> right like, sure. Why don't we play with the toys we're given? Sure. You know, going back to the second quote about... Um, fingering mother nature because she likes it or whatever i don't think that was the quote sorry i wasn't paying attention but it's just this thing that kind of says it's there like we have the components so well it's what the doctor says yeah. in the beginning yeah see that shut off the argument for me that was the definitive point where i thought okay the film has uh tied up that loose end sure. and we're moving on the doctor says oh no no no, no. i'm sorry you're too stupid to understand yeah it's just 
the best of yeah. both of you. Yeah. He's essentially just saying, you know, you where I think he says something along the lines of human beings are imperfect enough. We want to give the kid the we best give chance him a fight possible. And chance. Sure. Which, absolutely. I mean, if you put it in that regard, it makes a lot of sense. A lot of people Certainly. will argue that I want a natural birth because I love my child no matter what. But well, a lot of people honest, also want a fucking dolphin birth. So, you know, yeah, what? that's true. That's <laughs> but I wouldn't I would prefer a dolphin birth eugenic baby if the two options are natural dolphin birth and eugenic dolphin birth that's when are you ever faced with those those two options a gun is held to your head and those are the two options given to you i don't know michael bay don't give him any fucking ideas so i guess my point and the reason that i feel like uh that's really all we need to to say about that conversation is that i don't view this as one versus the other i don't view this as a new problem yeah, I don't think genetic manipulation creates a new problem in the future. I think it's an extension. It's just an evolution, I guess, to continue that metaphor of an existing conundrum of class warfare. Sure, and I have. think I think that you you hit it right on the head when you say that it seems like the movie is kind of about eugenics versus natural genetics, mm -hmm. but it's really you said it while we were watching. It's just that the society around it is afraid the yeah. society around it is basically an extrapolation of the people who in our society today are afraid of eugenics and who get really uncomfortable when presented with the idea that somebody may have chosen their child's eye or hair color sure that to the nth degree well is look at the history of eugenics i mean eugenics is a dirty word for that yeah. exact reason the the film makes this choice sure. to you know, next to, uh, what is it, degenerate? or uh, uh, Degenerate. Gene? Degenerate, yeah. thank yeah, you. Lame. I couldn't even, my, my degenerate. brain wouldn't yeah. even process. Yeah. Uh, eugenics sounds like a nice yeah. word, you know? We're using it so casually because the film makes it sound like, like that's the, that's the clean, sparkly version of what you call right. it. Right. And it, I mean, it doesn't necessarily help that 95% of the time you hear the word eugenics, it's tied to Nazis. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's my point. Unfortunately, you get, you get that aspect of it tied in with, but I mean, people are just afraid of it. Well, it's, so that's interesting. And I want to come back around to this, uh, this conversation about the society they live in and, uh, and what the film is actually saying, uh, I think what my takeaways from that are. But when we look at the environment that this is in, we look at a throwback to mm -hmm. what old people find safe, yeah. to the classic. I mean, this is Gattaca's noir version of the future. You know, you uh, you made fun of the stupid fax machine that checks your urine. <laughs> but I mean, they might as well be using typewriters yeah, it's in this true. movie. This is a film from 1997 depicting the future. You know, he's using heavy books in his workout mm -hmm. uh, to type notes about this movie I am using something that does not have a physical keyboard and has also replaced all books forever. It's a little fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, you think, you know, just a few short years later, Minority Report comes out right. and becomes the gold standard of futurism, yeah. of future technologies. Now, anytime you see any new piece of technology, you know, look at when uh, Microsoft had the Kinect, right? right? Where all the gaming systems kind of came out with these motion controls. I mean, we did it first but mm -hmm. then you have uh playstation has what move or whatever it's called I, right yeah i think so neither one of us on playstation nope. and everyone on this show hates video games so it doesn't matter <laughs> my point is these motion controls came out powerful new technology everyone compared it to minority report surface computing tablet computing comes out ipads come out everybody thinks oh yeah like minority report uh -huh. you always compare new technologies to minority report and the fact that we're still doing that 10 maybe 20 years later right is uh yeah it's been about 10 years since minority report right mm -hmm. so th that's amazing to think just a couple years later this film isn't antiquated it's not a film from the 70s depicting right. the future this film chose to set itself in noir future and i think it does that um i mean one they don't care right you know, and i think that's ultimately it but two we want our focus to be on the fancy new minority report thing in Gattaca is genetic manipulation. Right. We don't want it to be the nice cars we're driving. We're going to drive throwback cars. Yeah, it's again, it's really similar to Equilibrium, where while Equilibrium is a futuristic sci-fi movie, it's not about the technology sure. of that futuristic society. It's about a single aspect of the culture and how the people are living and that's what the plot of the story is about. It doesn't yeah. really matter that they're peeing on their fax machine. For sure. Because 
It's not about the fax machine. Yeah, the movie is more concerned um, with the content of that voiceover. Sure. It's one of the few movies I think I've ever seen that's made to deliberately show off a story and very little else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a captivating person sitting in a chair with a tall drink ready to tell you a tale about some I mean that's all that's that's there we're doing a great job of storytelling right anything else it views as a distraction so we want actors in their place conveying their points we want a very minimalistic look to it yeah a very noir look that everyone should be familiar with nothing you know terribly fancy the fanciest thing we see is rocket ships taking off right which is to tell us how exciting it is when rocket ships sure. take off. It gives us an end destination. <laughs> it's a goal for our race. Right. The one thing that could get overlooked here is Vincent's passion, you know, among all this chat about genes, because there's a lot of fucking chat about sure. genes. And, you know, we do have these brief moments that nail it, I think, hard enough that we don't need to constantly stress how cool space is and how right. cool rocket ships are. Right. He, when he's talking about <laughs> Titan, Right. Uh -huh. They're at that uh, dinner conversation and he's trying to he does the thing where he blows in the glass. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny because Eugene's talking about how they got to let the wine sit and fucking how ferment and breathe. all that stuff from sideways. And uh, Vincent's like, yeah, that's nice. Watch me blow all the smoke yeah. into the glass. But he's trying to, you know, give him that sort of Neil deGrasse Tyson look at. Like, look at this cool hands-on space thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's talking about Titan. He's trying to get him excited, telling him things like, you know, he, he wouldn't have to worry about his legs there. It's those brief moments that kind of, it makes me think back to the film Contact. When yeah. we did that, please don't listen to that episode. Well, actually, that was all right. It was with Silence of the Lambs, right? Oh, yeah. We, yeah. No, we probably did a terrible job. But did we really do that with Silence of the Lambs? We did. We put Jodie and... Foster with Jodie Foster? I think that's, yeah. Yeah, we even made fun of that at the time. Bad I move. Year double one of feature. Double Feature. <laughs> Year one. We're telling a different story than Contact, which was uh, a lot of those inspirational, you know, we found a, a signal kind mm -hmm. of moments, those excitable moments. Those moments are here, too. They're buried under the rest of, of what the story's telling us. I think they're buried under drive. I think that's ultimately the theme of the yeah. movie is drive. Sure. It's the, about not having, not holding anything back for the way home or what does he say? Yeah. That's he didn't the, save anything for the swim back. For the swim back. Right. Right. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the film. It's the extent of what he'll do or what he really has to do. Sure. It's kind of just about taking the, you know, taking the, I don't, I don't even want to use all the stupid fucking euphemisms they came up with. He's <laughs> born normally. Sure. Without eugenics. And it's you don't about want to call taking, him a godchild or whatever. No, I don't. It's stupid. They're all stupid. I hate <laughs> shit like that. It's about taking that, basically the, you know, the gamble that he was given by being born without some eugenic thing. Mm. showing that even so there's really no way to get an accurate you can't just go he's gonna die when he's 30 sure there are so many factors outside of oh yeah the scientific realm and so many random variants which they also show with eugene yeah who's supposed to be the absolute perfect human being sure and he, you know, ends up second place in the Olympics and then tries to kill himself. Well, and now his job all day is to piss in jars. Mm -hmm. That's literally, you, you wouldn't have thought when you constructed that baby on a sheet, when you were uh, playing D&D &D and outlining your fucking sure. character, which is essentially what this is. Yeah, except you don't get to play as them unless you're a horrible parent. Live vicariously through your child. Well, if your goal was to piss in jars for the rest of your life, then let me tell you, we have a surprise in store. Is that a minor action? I think it's really funny that that's his job, though. I really sure. like when we, you know, every time we come home to Eugene and he's doing just something about that. The film never really makes a joke that I feel like is always there. Well, it's kind of this weird. I mean, if you think about it too long, you get into the honey, I'm home. What's for dinner? Oh, I made you a bunch of jars of urine and some packets of blood. I think the, you know, the point where you get to that is when he goes into the chamber, you know, I have a present for you. Yeah. It's enough urine and blood to last you two lifetimes. That's really the, the final straw for me where I say, okay, this is gross, buddy. Seriously. <laughs> you know, it drives home that that's, that's really what he does for a living. When he says, oh, you've ruined an entire days of work, he meant pissing in jars all day. Right. But his extreme behavior is necessary, and that comments on the society he lives in. 
this uh, this society that values these people who are, you know, boxes checked off at birth or before birth. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think the movie really says something very strongly about. You know, it seems to argue that the augmented genetics has affected society more than the lives of individuals. It's that reaction, which uh, in a way is humorous to me because that's what a lot of people take away from the film. I see this film and I see a film about a society that goes, oh no, we have the power to check off boxes. What will become of society? (laughs) Shame all the natural people. And then everyone else sees this film and comes out thinking, oh no, what if we had a society where you could check off boxes? (laughs) You know what I mean? That's... The, the movie is almost commenting on that very perspective that everyone else feels like they're taking away right. from it. It's a sort of catch-22 that we've created our own conundrum there. If there is any, you know, any new conundrum to society, it's been created by that hysteria. Mm-hmm. It's been created by the fact that we're all afraid of what will happen if we don't check off the right boxes. Once there's genetically superior babies... We're all afraid that will determine our entire future. When I think Gattaca, as you brilliantly stated, the two fucking main characters prove that that's not true. Right. One has his boxes checked off and he fails <laughs> and one has no boxes checked off. And isn't that ultimately what the movies try as he gets blown yeah. into space? I think that is pretty much the point of the film is that honestly, it doesn't fucking matter because at the end of he the day, wins, well, at the end of the day, his lack of augmentation yeah, at the end of the day, God fucked up and who's going <laughs> to fix it. Well, and it's that cultural fear that's why Superman works, right? Yeah, right. The silly thing the movie does where he takes off his glasses sure. and no one recognizes him. Right. But they make a great point that totally justifies that. They don't want to believe that one of their elite did it. Sure. When you go into that society saying, oh, yeah, I had my boxes checked off, mm-hmm. then everyone thinks, oh, I've seen your genetic makeup. You yeah. are one of the elite. It couldn't have possibly have been him. Well, they kind of, they, they, they mention when was the last time anyone looked at a picture? Sure. Because right. it's really, it's not about what you look like. It's right. about that on paper, you're the perfect human being. Well, and of the, uh, of the gum shoes, cause again, film noir, come on. Mm-hmm. The older seasons cop, right. who I assume was probably the more natural of the two of them. Cause mm-hmm. we know his brother had the, the manipulation yeah. done. Uh, his brother also seems to be in some kind of higher rank, although I never really figured out. The older guy right. just calls him sir. He doesn't have to wear a hat. I'm never going to be convinced of the guilty party, but let's say it was the director, because sure. we never really find out, right? The director doesn't have much to say <laughs> once mm-hmm. he's caught. The guy, Alan Arkin's character, right? Yeah. Uh, he says, oh yeah, the guy's just talking a ton now, and then right. it pans to him, and he's just silent, staring there with a smile right. on his face. In in the smaller, in the mini story arc of Who Done It. The natural cop found out, and the genetically altered cop uh, sucks at his job. Well, but and then at the his... same time, he finds out, he unravels a bigger story. Well, he does, but that story got in the way of him doing his job. Yeah. See, it's this just, is just another one it of those is. things. It is. It's another example of, turns out, doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, there's a lot of variables going on. In fact, there may be so many variables going on that we might as well give everyone a fighting chance and control the few variables we have access to. <laughs> Class warfare will always exist, genetic or monetary or what have you. Somebody will always be born with a leg up, but there's a lot of variables in life. There's a lot of chance, and everybody needs to stop fucking worrying about the future (laughs) and genetics so goddamn much. Um, Let's go back in time to 1985. Yeah. Which is the year of Reanimator. It is, in fact, the year of reanimator how fucking good is reanimator reanimator has got to be one of the best movies ever made and it's also probably one of those movies that 10 minutes after you watch it you forget it's the best movie ever made you and do. i think that's a good you and place. i do nobody yeah. else does i think that's a good place for it to be though yeah i like that i forget how good reanimator is because it's otherwise, a pleasant surprise when you come back yeah otherwise i would show it to people and watch it all the time and dissect it and i don't think it wants to be dissected probably not at the level that i would dissect it you know watching it 10 times a week great let's now ruin that for the rest of the internet that's what we do no you're right though reanimator is one of the many many movies we cover where people say it's their favorite movie it's the greatest movie of all time really with uh, any horror movie i think you can find uh, a cult of people that's the idea cult films right right uh that think it is the greatest movie of all time but man fucking reanimator just hits all the great spots yeah so it's a hp lovecraft adaptation and it's uh herbert west reanimator herbert west colon reanimator right 
Herbert West is Jeffrey Combs. Is Jeffrey Combs. We talked about Jeffrey Combs a lot. The uh, the Music Box show where we talked about yeah, Reanimator. We talked about him with uh, our buddy Jeremy Caston while we he was did. hiding from producers in his car. Yeah, so we've exhausted conversations on Jeffrey Combs. Apparently we haven't because we just saw Reanimator and we were really <laughs> stoked about him. He does a fucking phenomenal job and he's great to watch. Yeah, he is. But uh, Jeffrey Combs is awesome and that's yeah. that's all that needs to be said that's at this really, moment in yep. time. Go back to the other shows, watch some other Jeffrey Combs stuff. He's a blast. Specific to Reanimator, some of my favorite things are just the way he moves, the physicality, uh, as well as his dialogue delivery. You know, the the sort of dominance he has as the weird, creepy kid who lives upstairs. Yeah. Or I guess who is your roommate who lives yeah. in the basement, really. Right. Oh, he's hanging out in the basement. Don't know what's going on down there. Got a fridge in his room. Yeah, this is the unexamined kid who's always in the basement. Sure. Here, the roommate decides, well, you know what? I'm going to hang out in the basement, too. Yeah. And, and we get this far superior story because of it. <laughs> but when I talk about physicality, I mean, I think about scenes like uh, the one where, you know, he's over at um, uh, placing his hand on Dr. Dan, who's in shock. And he's telling him, oh, it's just shock. And he flips out the tape recorder. Yeah. Does a little spiral, slides yeah. it into his front pocket. He's just really fucking smooth about it. I really love the notion that there's this guy who, first off, he's a he's a renegade student. Sure, yeah. He, apparently, he cannot be taught enough. Yeah, right. On his daily right. his daily class itinerary. Yeah, doesn't fulfill his thirst for knowledge, so he has to sure. break into the school after hours. For the sheer sake of learning. <laughs> right, right. Because that's, the, that's his goal. Because there's not enough learning during the day, so he has to learn after hours. Yeah, for mad science, this isn't about world domination. Yeah, he just wants to know. He's just endlessly curious, and he's just always... He takes every opportunity to experiment. Yeah. A really good example, the moment that just, like, for me, I just crack up, is when... He cuts off the head, Doctor Hill's head, head. I was just and then he that. sits there yep. and stares at it for a second and goes, "I've never done whole parts." Yeah, right. Whereas this is anybody, another learning experience. For yeah, him. anybody in their right mind would go, "Oh my god, I killed somebody." Yeah, but instead he just stares at it and goes, "Hmm, science." Yeah. Well, that's the body in general. He kills the guy and then goes, "Dan, Dan, Dan, get your shit together." This is a this is a body that died just moments ago. Yeah. This is the best possible. This is our freshest specimen. Oh man, it's perfect. The intensity he gives in in something like that. You know, he takes that shovel to the head, and in one minute, he's an intense supervillain. He is uh, a twisted, deranged serial killer, and then the very next moment. He's delivering a physical comedy scene. Cat wrestling. I mean, he's doing, well, the cat wrestling too, but I mean, even just with the prop of that head. Sure. You know, head falls over, pick oh, it back yeah. up, head falls over, <laughs> places it on that uh, that gross little, something about, you know, the head the, being severed with a shovel, fine yeah. with that. As soon as you put it on a spike, I'm yeah, uncomfortable. come on. That hurts. Feed it some blood. I think it's his intensity that allows a physical comedy moment like that to exist. It's uh, fantastic. Well, we've gotten Jeffrey Combs on the show before. Sure. We've also gotten Hans Gruber on the show before. Hans Gruber was uh, Alan Rickman's character in a one Die Hard. But that was later. Yeah, that was three years after the Hans Gruber, who's the initial scientist whose eyes explode in I, the animator. <laughs> that's a great scene, too. Yeah, it is. That's a setting up, that's what you want scene. It's a shame that of all the Hans Grubers in cinema history... Uh, or these two. Is there another one? I hope there's more. There I may. Hope there's a ton we don't If know there's about. not, there will be. Uh, never was Hans Gruber played by Udo Kier. That's a yeah, shame. It's a real shame. But I'm sorry. We'll go back to the eyes exploding. <laughs> there's, um, there's a scene early in the movie. We always talk, I talk a lot about that's what you want. We yeah. talked about that with the sure. Zack Snyder stuff. Right. Um, but there's another scene in here that I think is really, uh, really great for discussing that, which is the scene where you first see Dan and Megan playing. And Megan's doing a little coy, no, no, no. And yeah. there's that great transition to her just shouting yes yeah. you know, when they're fucking or yeah. whatever. That's also kind of a metaphor for the movie. Right. But that is, isn't that the essence of that's what you want? No, I think the essence of that's what you want is uh, getting eaten out by a severed head. Well, okay, so maybe it's the opposite. Because <laughs> when Megan's on the table and she's completely naked, it's that infamous, you know, it's that infamous sure. scene. Uh, the first thing you think is, hey, Naked Megan, 
That's cool. You're shouting yes. Yeah. And then you get the head moving down and then you start shouting, start shouting no. no. It goes you backwards. You get all squirmy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but that is the essence of that scene. No, it is. It is, a, it is right. a, yeah. a yes, no switch. It's, uh, it's which I like and especially because I'd seen it and then I showed it to some other people and mm-hmm. then I just sit there cackling yeah, right. at the horrendousness that's sure. about to happen and sure. just watching the joy melt to horror know, it's on everybody's face. It's great, but I feel like although it is the opposite reaction, it is a essentially doing the same sure. thing and i love it for that you externalize it different because inside yeah. you do want that that's why it exists yeah. in the film right you do want it to sure. go there because it's fucked up and it makes you giggle and squirm and it's all those awful moments those eye popping moments all yeah. throughout the films we've done the effects are really great for what's going yeah. on in this movie they're I fantastic think the, the foley sells a lot of that mm-hmm. i mean the visual effects are are really good too but well the visual effects are actually really bad are they really bad? Well, I don't it's even kind notice. of this hybrid because you can tell how they're doing everything. Sure. But it works so well. Well, yeah. Everything is obvious. All the special effects are really easy to understand. But that, for some reason, doesn't ruin the effect of seeing sure. a severed head in a pan. We're talking about the severed head again, well, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's mostly the severed head, mostly when when uh, so many Dr. West go into puts that. the oh, bone saw through the guy's chest. Oh, sure, yeah. It's obvious special effects, but sure. it's so raw that that makes it okay. Right. And, it adds and to also, the I mean, the Foley does help. You're dead on with the gurgling blood oh, yeah. while Dr. Hill is breathing. Yeah, like Q-tip swab in the brain or peeling back the skin over yeah. his head, over his face. Like a large the orange. Movie. Yeah, you try this movie on mute and you notice these effects feel completely different because of that. For as much as we've ever gone on and on about Foley, uh, nothing really teaches you better than just watch those scenes over again yeah. on mute. The smart way they accomplish a lot of these headless scenes, I mean, uh, you know, that's something that, that brings a lot of joy to me when I'm watching this. The, uh, you know, every time the head's in a different spot, you have to kind of, you can't keep using the same effect over and over or people get it. Sure. So you put the head in different places and you kind of figure out if he's holding the head, maybe we put it through a torso or uh-huh. maybe it's an under the table kind of thing. But where a lot of places, if you have a severed head, the quick and easy way is just to cover the neck with something, say the edge of a pan, and not show it. And everybody kind of knows it's a guy under the table, but we all play along. Right. But they make a point of showing the gored neck several times yeah. in several different ways. They show the head in different environments, and that sells it. Now, this is a uh, pre-green screen, pre, uh, you know, that overly showy composites right. kind of thing, where now you can take a severed head and do anything you want with it. And that's what I mean when I say overly showy. If we were mm-hmm. to chop off a head in a movie today, we use a composite, we can throw the head around, we can, you know, make the head talk as it's being tossed through midair, we can do anything with that. It's almost showing off so much that we... it feels like an effect yeah for sure it feels like people jumping around going hey look at this thing we're accomplishing over here we've green screened the body out yeah for some reason this head feels more like a soccer ball it feels more like a thing in a tray you could run over and punt across the room all right we've spent enough time talking about splat i want to talk about some of the themes of this movie all right uh not mad science no so this is you know when i said earlier uh commentaries and ways you might not suspect them or on things you might not suspect or whatever the hell i said in the intro that's what i was talking about um it, in gattaca obviously we we went through that too but i feel like this movie could have easily been mad science frankenstein should god right. play monster nature something you know what i mean sure do you? I'm surprised. Yeah, I do. I'm just kind of, I'm trying to imagine Frankenstein with cool glowy green shit and that would make me watch it. This isn't should man play God. This is uh, bringing up these other interesting questions that you can use the same kind of story to tell. When we uh, urged filmmakers to do Frankenstein without hitting on the same goddamn thing everybody's always hit on, that is Reanimator. Yeah. Reanimator asks these questions, you know, what is the brain? Where is the will? The mm-hmm. personality? These are really interesting questions. Sure. It's a movie that naturalizes life. Uh, You know, Dr. Hill talks about in his lecture, first of all, he talks a little bit about the afterlife before he even gets to Will, Mm -hmm. kind of dispelling uh, the religious and and sentimental components of the body. Right. Those kind of magical thinking parts of where you go after you die and the nature of the soul and the Paul Giamatti of it all. 
But, you know, Wes brings that up again. All life is a, a physical, what does he say, a physical and chemical solution when he's yeah, talking about like the cat? That. Yeah. Um, you know, as he's reanimating the cat, he's that's how he's trying to convince Dan. Sure. Well, obviously, this is just chemicals. Right. So, you know, we can, we can undo this. And therein kind of lies another philosophical question. Are we giving life or animating the dead? That's not sure. just a semantic point. It's literally saying... You know, let's go back to that component of where is the will and the personality. Mm-hmm. This is why that question's relevant. If we were to animate a corpse, are we animating a corpse or are we bringing somebody back to life? Sure. Is it a zombie or is it resurrection? Yeah. And West, I mean, clearly he thinks he's bringing life back, right. but he's also highly excitable. I mean, yeah. Well, I never actually, the only time it seems to work is in the only instance that it doesn't benefit him, which is with Dr. Hill. Everybody else kind of turns out to be dumb or insane sure. or a cat. Well, so we can, <laughs> it turns out it's a cat. Uh, we get a little bit of both because when before we have Dr. Hill, and really, as you said, everybody but Dr. Hill appears to be a walking zombie. Mm-hmm. Dr. Hill is still a fucking creep and, you know, tries to perform oral sex on Megan. Yeah. Let's just make that sound as um, factual and scientific as possible. That would lead you to believe there's still a bit of will there. There's still a bit of personality and soul to that. <laughs> or that it would have made for really funny scenes and we couldn't leave it out. I don't think the movie necessarily answers it. And as you said in in the beginning of our conversation, when the movie does not beckon for that kind of deconstruction, that's why. Right. It's bringing up these points. It's kind of making you go, huh, in between the scenes where you're enjoying yourself. Right, exactly. The downtime scenes, we're going to just fill those with, oh, I don't know, philosophy. Let's yeah. throw philosophy, philosophy in there. Philosophy and bright green. Yeah, we'll make everybody go, huh, hey, cool, glowing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll get right back to splat. This is what I'm talking about when I say this movie's fucking perfect. Yeah. How great is that? That's it's exactly awesome. what I want. It is. I if want you... a bunch of splat, and in the time where we're spending running from one room to another, I want you to bring up a thought experiment. Yeah, uh, well, and the best part about it is you have these well-learned, you know, the best in their field of scientists. So you don't need a crew of 10 people. You don't need the psychologist, sure. the criminal pathologist. The, mm-hmm. You have two guys that are well-versed in pretty much every aspect of the medical field. Right. And so they can deconstruct situations just between the two of them. They've and, taken their psych class. Yeah. And that's where you get all of these philosophical points made. That's where you, you don't end up slowing down with one person telling the other one why or sure, how. Sure. And that's that also helps you get around kind of all the bullshit that yeah. doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel condescending either. Right. You feel like you're hanging out with those two people. Sure. They're not talking down to you. If you were if there were any real explanation taking place, you would have to go, Well, how come if that guy gets crushed by a door and then strangled, right. Right. we can still bring him back to life. Right. But if somebody gets shot in the face, we can't. But they're both scientists. They both understand that. And so that doesn't actually get brought up. And we're, we feel stupid for wondering. Well, the body's not breakable plastic. I mean, come on. Yeah. Or it's uh, the plastic is the I mean, that's the durable part. That's the unbreakable part. I, what does he call that man's one of man's more durable inventions yeah. or whatever? Uh, certainly more durable than this. And then gestures to the body. He considers God's handiwork flawed. He's just trying to, you know, straighten out uh, uh, where God cut corners. So those are some of the major themes, but there's definitely this theme uh, specifically early on in the movie of kind of out with the old, in with the new, in these ways of thinking. And when you have a challenging idea like reanimating the dead, how Mm -hmm. fucking absurd is our show, by the way? When you have a challenging idea like reanimating the dead, for instance, uh, the old ways might uh, get in your way. You need to go out with the old, in with the new. When you're talking to Dr. Hill, especially... Early in the movie, we're mocking the old research, the old way of thinking. Sure. Oh, your research says the brain can only last this long. Well, actually, I said this long to this long. Sure, you're closing their minds before they even have a chance to learn. Right, right. He's saying be more open-minded. He's the uh, the hip new kid, sure. the hip foreign kid yeah. coming in, introducing all these crazy ideas, mixing things up. Go figure Herbert West is the hippie. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, that's it. That's not the only time either. I mean, Megan, too, you know, mocking her dad's uh, Puritan thinking. Again, early in the film where we're trying to set up, challenge tradition, challenge ritual. Ask, as, you know, a young student might, why are things the way they are? What if we did things differently? That's how new ideas come to fruition. That's, I mean, honestly, I love that they throw that theme in there. Almost uh, 
carelessly, almost mm-hmm. like they don't even give a fuck that it's there. It just happens right. to be there. Because that's such an important theme to me. It's something that I think we should carelessly blase throw into fucking everything. Because that's how we get new ideas, right? That's how we stop using typewriters forever. Right. That's how we come up with new things is by challenging the way things have always been. That's that uh, John Waters idea. It's breaking down taboos. Right. Why are things like this? Why did we have a Puritan mindset? What would it be like if we didn't? Let's try it out. Why don't we just animate a few corpses? <laughs> Ethical grounds. Who cares about those? That might be pushing the line, obviously, but sure. you get what I'm saying, yeah, right? Absolutely. Fuck ritual. Fuck things have always been this way. So let's keep making them this way. I think that's a reason right there just to do things the other way. Yeah. Why do it this way? What's better about it? I don't know. We haven't done it that way yet. That's true. That's not the way it's always been done. (laughs) Therefore, we should give it a shot. Can we just throw that under the heading of rebellious learning? Yeah, I think that that? fits fits wonderfully in there. We'll learn our own goddamn way. (laughs) Fuck the system. Rebellious learning. That's one of the best ideas I'm going to take away from from us seeing this film this time. (laughs) I love that. So there's all these great things in Reanimator that you and I, we talk about and we make them sound pretty heavy. But my favorite part, my actual favorite part of Reanimator, and the thing that will uh, really drive me to see it again and again, is the humor. Yeah. It's, uh, it's dark humor, which is we found when we started doing this show, when we started year two, mm-hmm. and we decided, uh, let's just put our own things into the show. We're no longer going to use the year one formula. Right. You remember dark humor was uh, like a fifth of what we decided to compose our show of. Right. That's hard. We can't find that many movies that we feel like are our specific brand of dark humor. Well, it has to be really dark and really funny. Yeah, right. It has to be very dark and very humor. Yeah. That's the problem, among other things. You know, dark humor encompasses a lot of things. So that was kind of generic to just throw that out there. But, uh, I mean, you look at the humor in this movie. Yeah, you could call it dark humor. But don't tell any of the characters that. But it's not even just deadpan. It's passive humor. Sure. It's the sort of humor, and and everybody knows a couple movies in their head probably when I say these, and please email them to us. The sort of movies where you can show them to another person and they might not get that there's jokes in the movie. You know what I mean? Well, there are a certain brand of movie... And Stuart Gordon does these really well. He does. He does. Where you know there's jokes in his movie. You, I mean, yeah, everybody gets absolutely, it. But, but it you watch the movie. The jokes aren't written into the dialogue. The jokes aren't reacted to. And it's almost if you didn't pick up that the movie was doing it intentionally, you'd think it was so bad it's good. Funny. Yeah, right. Except the movie knows that the jokes are so bad they're yeah. good. You know what I mean? Something like wrestling with a cat. Sure. But having jeffrey combs as herbert west do it yeah where right. no one this is a horrifying experience sure. everyone in the theater is cracking up half of them think the movie's dumb right and the other half realize the movie is making a joke well and you know why i like that so much on an intellectual level when i say it's passive humor it's the sort of humor and maybe this is part of what draws me to dark humor is that it feels like everyday life humor yeah these are the kind of things that even if you are a sinister mad scientist you would sever a head and pick it up and it would fall back down. Sure. And it would. I mean, that's funny. Yeah. I've always asked myself that, you know, the deeper we get into the show. What would you do if a head you severed <laughs> fell down? No. no, I mean about dark humor. Oh. Because we come on the show, we talk about humanism and we watch Happy Go Lucky and we love people, mm-hmm. but we find mean, awful things happening to people really funny. Yeah. And why is that? And that's a, that's a question I'm still pondering. But Reanimator kind of makes me think about that. It makes me think, you know, if there was a guy cutting off heads, occasionally one might fall over, and that's pretty fucking funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just kind of comes down to one of those situations where, I guess, uh, I don't know, people would say, oh, you got to laugh. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right? You almost find your own humor in it. You know, when they go into uh, the all the cadavers, and we're going body after body, and this one up, shotgun wound to the head, uh, this one malpractice. And then they find one, and what? What is the? What's the cause of death? Oh, on he it? just dropped dead. Yeah, right. As if in this world, those are the only things that yeah. happen. You either get shot in the face, or uh, the body just drops dead. Yeah, and stops working. I, you know, to read into it even more, to again, to to find your own humor in it, uh, they may have just stumbled on the cure for death. They may be shitty students. Yeah. If they go in here and they go, well, what's this one? Oh, shotgun wound. Well, there's your problem. Oh, what's this one? Oh, I don't know. He dropped dead. It's almost yeah. like they don't know what the fuck yeah. they're doing. <laughs> and so it's able to mix these different things like physical humor or surprise humor into that deadpan package. 
into um, you know something that say the music or different tonal things might tell you is serious. Uh, something like when when Hills is being super creepy to Megan after mm-hmm. her dad dies, comforting her, saying, "You know, I know you're all by yourself now." And as he says, "I know you're all by yourself." Her father's creepy bloody head just rises up yep. and interrupts the scene between the <laughs> two of them. But the music, it's still dark and it's still serious. The music plays great deadpan. It's perfect. I think it's funny that her father interrupts them again through the door when Dan and Megan are getting all sentimental. Yeah. He bursts in through the door. That's, <laughs> it's just kind of his thing. It's yeah. his gimmick. He just rises up out of the middle of the scene <laughs> to interrupt whatever's going on. Ah, oh, reanimator. Fucking great. Show somebody reanimator. That's everybody's Show homework. Show everybody reanimator. Doublefeatureshow.com is this website where you can go and you can... Uh, find chapters, I find believe, chapters. is what you're doing You there. can look at all the Killapaloozas. You can look at some directors. You can Ooh, download... Stuart Gordon is on there. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so I talked to Stuart Gordon for a really giddy, I don't know, four minutes or something at the Music Box instead of watching From Beyond, which, by the way, I still haven't seen. I really need to get back around to that. But to. that uh, interview somewhere on the website. Yeah, uh, and you can also download an MP3 version of... Uh, True. Double feature, which apparently uh, people still do. Yeah, if we're, it ever works. We're discovering. Yeah, one or two people do that a week, and they usually have to send me an email to tell me it doesn't work, and then I fix it. So we apologize for what's wrong with double feature. Sorry about that. Show.com. <laughs> uh, or send us an email about what's wrong with that's it. That's double feature show at gmail.com. You, we're really getting this down. This yeah, I know. We're back pros. Back and forth. Um, and uh, yeah, emails are good to send us. Uh, send us the name of the person that you showed reanimator to also oh, their yeah. facebook contact information yeah wait what so you know so we can open a dialogue creepy this is gonna sound crazy and i loved gattaca gattaca was great too we really nerded out on reanimator at yeah. the end there but if you just watch these two you might be inclined to agree with me this is just my own odd observation i think reanimator might be the more subtle of the two. I think you're probably right. I didn't see that coming, and if you didn't just watch the two movies, this is one of those moments where you're scoffing and banging your yeah. MP3 player around. But if you watch them back to back, I think you have this idea in your head that you come away from Gattaca, you wait a couple of years, and it's the it's the quiet subtle of the two uh-huh. movies, and I don't know if that's true. No, his name's Eugene. I mention that only because I continue, even after year one, to be interested in how our brains manipulate films after they're far over. Yeah. As a crew, you go through all these pains to make this film perfectly the way you see fit. And then someone watches it and two years later remembers it completely different. Yep. They remember Reanimator being loud and explosive and they remember Gattaca being the subtle one. So uh, let's get two other films wrong then. Perfect. We're going to do uh, next week. We're going to do some uh, Cemetery Junction, which is Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant. Also, a little Carl Pilkington in there. See if you little can spot the Pilkington. Pilkington. Great. Um, and we're going to do that with The Ledge, which is a film that I know nothing about. Oh, great. That's exactly why I wanted to pair those two movies, so that we could misinterpret them. <laughs> um, Cemetery Junction just doesn't have enough atheism, so I thought I'd That's use The Ledge to wedge it in there. There you but, go. But uh, The Ledge is a talk. There's going to be a lot of talking next time on right. Double Feature. So for a change, we're going to get a lot of talking in on yes, Double Feature. That's I the guess. Plan. Uh, that's the plan. Watch more fucking film. Bye.